The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. I'm here to get a student bus pass, please. Of course, madam. Do you want to buy a month bus pass, a six-month bus pass or a year pass? Oh, just a month pass, please. Right then. I'll just have to take a few details. Yes, of course. First of all, what's your name? Natalie Jameson. And how do you spell Jameson? J-A-M-E-S-O-N. Thank you. And what's your address? 45 Forest Avenue, Newlands, Adelaide. Is that forest with one R or two R's? Just one. And what's the postcode, please? Oh, yes. It's 8490. Thanks. Now, what's your date of birth, if you don't mind me asking? Not at all. It's the 13th of May, 1982. I also need to know your telephone number here in Adelaide. OK. I just need to check that, as I only moved here last week. Now, where is it? Here we are. It's 6249-7152. Do you need a code or anything? Oh, no, that's OK, thank you. Can I see your university card, please? Yes, here it is. Good, that's fine. Now, for which zone do you need a pass? Well, I'm not sure. I was hoping you'd be able to help me, as I don't really know my way around here yet. As you know, I live in Newlands, and I have to get to the university campus in the centre of town every day. Well, the university is in Zone 1, and Newlands has two zones. The side nearer to the town centre is Zone 5, but the far side is Zone 6. What road is it that you live in again? Forest Avenue. Let's see on this map. There it is. The nearest bus stop is in Zone 5. That's lucky. Zones 1 to 6 are $15 more expensive. Great. Make the pass out for Zones 1 to 5 then, please. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. I've got some other questions too, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Well, this weekend my friend and I aren't doing anything, so we thought we'd take a trip out of town and visit somewhere new. Does the bus service run any trips like that? Yes, we've got a selection of trips. I'll tell you about some of them. Thanks. Right, the first one goes up to McDonald Nature Park. The bus leaves at 8 o'clock and takes about two hours to get there and leaves for the return at 4.30 in the afternoon. Once there, you can walk around the nature trails. It's really nice and the McDonald River runs through there and that's really beautiful, so take a camera with you. Then there's the Pearl Bay trip. The bus leaves at 9am and goes up the coast to Pearl Bay. How far is that? It's an hour away. Once there, you can walk along the cliffs up to Rocky Point, which has a famous view up the coast. Or you can just lie on the beach and swim. Don't forget to take your swimming gear and a towel. The water's pretty safe there and there are always lifeguards. The bus arrives back in Adelaide at 5pm. Mmm, that sounds nice. What else? Well, there's the Huron Gold Mine. It's just a half-day trip, leaving here at 9.30am and arriving back at 2pm. 
It only takes half an hour to get there, which is good. It's an old worked out mine that has changed into a sort of museum. They have all the old equipment and a guide takes you round some of the tunnels and shows you some of the techniques they used to use. You might even find some gold they missed. Yeah, I could do with that. It's pretty interesting, but the mines can be quite cold, so take a sweater. So how do those three sound? Quite interesting. I really like the idea of going up the coast and spending a day on the beach, but my friend Karen will like the idea of the nature park. I'd better wait and check out with her what she wants to do before booking. No problem at all. You just need to pop in sometime during the week and we'll make the booking. Thanks very much. You've been very helpful. No problem. See you later. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning everyone and welcome to this further education lecture on marine biology. Today we're going to look at the coelacanth. The discovery of the coelacanth has been compared to finding a dinosaur walking around today over 85 million years after it went extinct. The story began a few days before Christmas in 1938, when the first living coelacanth was discovered off the east coast of South Africa, at the mouth of the Chalumna River. The fish was caught in a shark gill net by Captain Goosen and his crew, who, recognising the bizarre nature of their catch, alerted the local museum in the small South African town of East London. The director of the East London Museum at the time was Miss Marjorie Courtney Latimer, after whom the coelacanth was eventually named. Miss Courtney Latimer offered bounties to fishermen for unfamiliar fish. It was Miss Courtney Latimer who alerted the prominent South African ichthyologist, Dr. J. L. B. Smith, who initially identified the fish, and subsequently informed the world about this amazing discovery. This first coelacanth led to the discovery of the first documented population, off the remote Comoros Islands between the mainland of Africa and Madagascar. For 60 years, this was presumed to be the only coelacanth population in existence. Originally, it was a concern that the coelacanth might have a very limited range and that overfishing along the Comoros Islands might wipe it out. However, scientists were amazed when, on July the 30th, 1998, an American scientist discovered a coelacanth population in Indonesia. Dr. Mark Erdman was on a honeymoon trip to the area investigating a coral reef research site when he spotted a strange fish being wheeled into the fish market. He recognized the fish as a coelacanth and snapped a picture before it was sold. Before you hear the rest of the podcast, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Dr. Erdman's subsequent research revealed that the people from Sulawesi had a name for it. Raja, king of the sea. The Sulawesi Silicant colony is about 10,000 kilometers east of where the silicants were previously known to occur in the western Indian Ocean. Both Sulawesi and Comoros silicants are quite different from all other living fish. But perhaps the most interesting feature of the silicanth is that it has paired lobed fins, which move in a similar fashion to our arms and legs. Coelacanths also have an extra lobe on their tail and a vertebral column that is not fully developed. They are the only living animal to have a fully functional intracranial joint, a division that separates the ear and brain from the nasal organs and eye, and allows the front part of the head to be lifted when the fish is feeding. The brown Sulawesi coelacanth and the steel blue Comoros coelacanth share these unusual characteristics. The discovery of the coelacanth in 1938 is still considered to be the zoological find of the century. This living fossil comes from a lineage of fish that was thought to have been extinct since the time of the dinosaurs. Coelacanths are known from the fossil record dating back over 360 million years and peaked in abundance about 240 million years ago. Before 1938, they were believed to have become extinct approximately 80 million years ago after mysteriously disappearing from the fossil record. How could the coelacanth disappear for over 80 million years and then turn up alive and well in the 20th century? The answer seems to be that fossil coelacanths appeared to live in environments with clay sedimentation with plenty of volcanic activity. Modern coelacanths, both in the Comoros and Sulawesi, inhabit caves and overhangs in vertical marine reefs at about 200 metres, environments not conducive to fossil creation. In 1991, scientists got a better understanding of the fish when the Comoros got their independence from France and French restrictions on research were lifted. This allowed scientists to study the fish off the Comoros Islands. As the animal hides in underwater caves some 300 to 700 feet down during the day and comes out at night to feed, diving is not an option. And previously only fishermen specimens had been available for study. But this time the scientists had their own submarine so they could study the coelacanth in its natural habitat through portholes. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. An understanding of customer psychology is an invaluable aid for retailers looking for ways to increase sales. Much can be done to the store environment to encourage shoppers to linger longer and spend more money. The first aspect to consider is the physical organisation of the store. 
placement of merchandise has a great deal of influence on what customers buy. For example, a common practice among retailers is to place the store's best-selling merchandise near the back of the store. In order to get to these popular items from the front entrance, customers have to walk down aisles filled with merchandise that they might not see otherwise. Carpets are also used to direct customers through particular areas of the store. Retailers choose carpets not only for their decorative or comfort value, but also because lines or other types of patterns in the carpets can subtly guide shoppers in certain directions. Besides encouraging shoppers to go to certain areas of the store, retailers also want to keep them in the store longer. One way to do this is to provide comfortable seating throughout the store, but not too close to the doors. This gives customers a chance to rest and then continue shopping. Retailers can do a number of things to create a pleasant atmosphere in the store, thereby encouraging more purchases. Music is commonly used, not as entertainment, but as a calming influence. It can slow the customer's pace through the store, making them spend more time shopping and consequentially making more purchases. Scents are also used in various ways. Everyone has had the experience of being drawn into a bakery by the smell of fresh bread. Experiments have been done with other types of scents as well. For example, the scent of vanilla has been used to increase sales in clothing stores. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Use of colour is another important aspect of store environment. Certain colours can affect behaviour as well as mood. Light purple, for example, has been found to have an interesting effect on customer behaviour. People shopping in an environment where light purple is the predominating colour seem to spend money more than shoppers in other environments. Orange is a colour that's often used in fast food restaurants. It encourages customers to leave faster, making room for the next group of diners. Blue, on the other hand, is a calming colour. It gives customers a sense of security, so it's a good colour for any business to use. In addition to using colour to create mood and affect customer behaviour, colour can also be used to attract certain kinds of customers to a business. Stores that cater to a younger clientele should use bold, bright colours, which tend to be attractive to younger people. Stores that are interested in attracting an older clientele will have more success with soft, subtle colours, as older people find these colours more appealing. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Thank you for inviting me to your residence meeting. My name is Martin Pugh from Safe Cell Alarms. I'm going to explain a little bit about home security, and I hope you'll all feel a bit better informed, and perhaps that you will even purchase one of the alarms we sell. It is all too easy these days for people to break into our homes. Did you know that 25% of all burglaries are committed by burglars breaking and entering via the back door? Even though it is locked, it is still relatively easy for someone to gain entry. And there are parts of our house that we think are not vulnerable because they look inaccessible. But they're not. So, if you're trying to protect your home, you should make sure the top floor is covered by that protection, not just the ground floor. We believe that the only way to secure your property is by having an alarm fitted. Just having the alarm on the outside can put burglars off, and we also recommend that you warn them about the alarm. To do this, we suggest you stick a sign in the front window of the house so it can be seen clearly. This alone should be enough to dissuade a burglar before they start. Now, our company has a range of alarms on offer, and I brought several along for you to see tonight. But let me just explain a few things about them. First of all, all of our alarms are highly visible. They're colored red, and on the underneath, there is a blue light, which you can see whether they are switched on or not. This acts as a deterrent to burglars who can see it as an active alarm system. Like most systems, our alarms are very sensitive, so you do need to look after them. You may be surprised to hear that a cat can often slink around unnoticed under the infrared beams, but a spider crawling across them will set them off. Also, our system is a little different from some. Most companies offer an option that connects their alarms to the police station. All our alarms have an automatic link to our company office. This means we can deal with a situation promptly and can sort out any alarms that have gone off by mistake. Okay, let me tell you about the installation of our alarms. Later on, I'll show you some house plans and diagrams of how the alarms operate, but you don't have to worry about them being intrusive as we normally put them in hallways rather than individual rooms. The diagrams show you how the beams work to cover the whole house in this way. Oh, one small thing while I remember is don't leave your security code in your house. A lot of people keep it in the kitchen or their study, but we suggest you leave it with a neighbor so that if there is a break-in, the burglars can switch the system off. Now, regarding the practical aspects of installation, I know that many of you are out all day, and I'm afraid we don't install the alarms at weekends. But we do offer a service where we can fit the alarm system in the evenings for you. But we do charge a little bit extra for that. Finally, we do offer a range of systems, so I suggest you look at the leaflets on our prices. And please don't be put off from investing in a more sophisticated system to protect your home as we do allow you to set up a monthly payment if it's too much in one go. Okay, now if you'd like to come forward... That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.